Hi, I'm Aldo. Welcome to Plays the Thing, the channel where I share my experiences prepping and playing tabletop role playing games. Today, I am doing the second play session report for the Sentinels of Justice game that I'm running using the Champions Now rules. Champions Now, of course, is that superhero role playing game written by Ron Edwards and published by Hero Games. And I want to start off this play report by thinking a little bit about my state of mind as I was trying to start this session. I'd had what I felt was a very successful first session. My players also enjoyed it. So I think it was basically a success, right? Um, in, in, uh, in over on Adept Play, um, I, uh, and in my last video, I had some discussion about uh, things that I thought I could have done differently or could have done better. But, you know, again, I'm not beating myself up for any of that. It's just kind of like looking back and finding missed opportunities and figuring out, um, you know, just just reflecting on them so that in future play, I can I can maybe be a little bit more. Um, you know, I can I can take advantage of, of what I've learned by looking back at, at, at what I did or didn't do in the first session. But it was a successful session and I walked away from it thinking a few things. First of all, I had decided that, you know, I was going to start by tugging at some things that were on Silver Spectre's feet, and specifically the fact that she is hunted by and hunts, right, the Silver Legion of America. And I hadn't really pulled on any of the other hero sheets um, in that first session, and I wanted to make sure that I shifted my focus a little bit to a different character and pulled on one or more uh, things that are on the other characters' hero sheets, right? That, that I can basically cycle through the characters and every four sessions or so, I should be throwing up one or two uh, different elements that are kind of being braided together in, in, a, in, a, in a developing, you know, an emerging uh, story. Um, so so I, I had that in mind. The other thing that I had in mind was um, that I'd started with this white supremacist focus and that had some elicited some very strong responses from the characters like the 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 brutality of this particular organization uh i could tell from the first session had made some significant um waves it ripples effects had had some significant effects on some of the characters and that's fantastic but i i didn't want to suddenly make the campaign only about that because the campaign was pitched as you know fighting supremacy right which they definitely did in this first session but also um depression right and so i was thinking okay if we're doing these first two sessions maybe i should start shifting you know uh, as we give time for the um, for the consequences of the first session to play out, let's introduce the depression angle um, to kind of get both of those themes up in the air. And um, so, I, 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 of all the characters, the two that I thought had that the most on their character sheets apart from Silver Spectre, but I didn't want to focus on Silver Spectre again uh, right now, were um, Major Shocker, who's this kind of community guy, good egg, looking out for for the underdog kind of in his neighborhood sort of sort of thing. He has a, a real kind of um, every man kind of uh, presence and is in touch with the every person, right? Um, uh, you know, in, in his community. So he's got the kind of community um, rootedness that, that I thought might be useful. He also has um, uh, Dr. Zap on his character sheet, who is a uh, DMPC who has um, as part of his, um, one of, one of this DMPC's disadvantages that he is often being kind of uh, played or pursued or or um, there are other parties out there who are interested in his technology. It's kind of a of a rotating hunted for him um, that then also, of course, becomes Major Cocker's hunted by virtue of it being Dr. Zapp's hunted. So 
So I thought, okay, maybe there's maybe there's something there. Maybe I can tug on there. And also Spitfire on her sheet has a few very kind of natu- naturalistic elements. She has her brothers who are wanting to pull her away from big city life and bring her back home where she can marry a guy. And, you know, she's kind of escaped um, that home life and doesn't want that in her life. So I thought it would be interesting to kind of like uh, pull on that a little bit. It's not directly a depression angle or anything like that, but um, uh, it's got some overtones of it. Cause I, I, I get the sense that that Spitfire's family has been disrupted by, by, by the great depression as it hit their small Texas town. And that because of that, the family's kind of fragmented and there's a kind of desire to pull them back together. So those are the things that were kind of running through my mind. And then I was like, okay, well, how do I, I thought that the thing that might generate more, you know, superheroic activity would be the, the Dr. Zap thing. And so I started thinking, okay, how do I pull on Dr. Zap on a major shocker sheet? And, um, I, and I was thinking, okay, what kind of great depression story can I think of? And I decided that I would be, allow myself to be inspired by, um, the reign of the Superman, Superman, the reign of the Superman, which was the first, uh, a proto Superman story written by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, where the, the Superman is a villain, but he's a villain that is um, villainous because he's been taken advantage of, um, you know, by the, you know, and, and was suffering from and taken it by the great depression, he's suffering from the great depression, the dislocations of the great depression, and then taken advantage of by, by elites, a scientific elite in, in that case. Right. So I said, okay, let me just take some, inspiration from that as i interact with dr zap okay so those that was my thinking um and then in addition to that of course touch base with the characters to see how they are bonding to each other and to themselves after the you know somewhat strong events of the of the first session and very specifically um on on uh just character sheet there is, um, you know, uh, uh, Maat is uncompromising in her sense of justice, but Dylan um, has stated as a value that he weighs um, context um, when judging people, and the suggestion is that he might not be fully on board with uh, with Maat's, you know, uncom- uncompromising sense of justice. So I was curious about how Dan was going to play that. And I was very curious to see how the players would respond to the other, the other heroes, I should say, would respond to just the car's actions of the night before and, uh, and how major shocker would deal with his injury. Right. So, and by the way, one last thing about the injury. Um, I, when I built the hazard that were the, uh, the, the 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 silver shirts um i i didn't make the uh the damage destructive which is what i meant to do but i didn't build it that way i made it i gave it you know the the you know i, I forget off the top of my head what they are but the the severe and and lethal you know uh um uh, advantages i think those are the correct ones that turned it effectively into an old school killing attack but the thing that i didn't do is make uh is make the attack um destructive which would have made the damage far taken made the damage far more difficult to heal but also would have brought down the the dice involved right so given that i kind of messed up on building the hazard in that way and i tweaked it for future use but since I, I didn't do that, I said, you know what? I'm just going to run with it. We're going to say that it wasn't as bad uh, an injury as it looked initially, although scary and still damaging. We let the damage heal as it normally would. I didn't want to retroactively make it destructive. Um, so that's fine. You know, uh, characters in, in, in fiction like this always, you know, kind of bounce back more quickly than they think. But uh, we we let the the fiction of the injury linger on, but the mechanic, the game effects, the game mechanics of it, um, were actually uh, by the end of the session were you know, or really by the beginning of the session they were no longer in play, except in the ways that Mike wanted to play it up as he played his character, right? 
So, so there's that. Okay. So, um, so let's, let's get to now that you know, kind of what was going on in my mind as I was kind of prepping the session, let's walk through the various interactions that happened, which were, I don't know. I think they were, they were robust. We didn't have to reach for any of this. This is just stuff that, that happened. So first I said, okay, what are you guys doing? As you're leaving the scene, what are you guys doing? Right. Um, and uh, Spitfire and Silver Spectre both said that they wanted to escort Major Shocker um, back to his Brooklyn home. Um, and we talked a little bit about how that would look. Um, uh, Major Shocker or Mike said, you know, that Major Shocker would would allow them to take him to Brooklyn. But once they got basically in his neighborhood, he was going to be very insistent that he can make it the rest of his way. And uh, they hesitantly kind of left them there um, to do that. You know, uh, Spitfire flew back to to uh, to Manhattan to her boarding house, which is run by a Mrs. McGillicuddy, who was up waiting for her and gave her some advice. And there were some interactions and there just some lighthearted uh, role play back and forth. She's a, a very supportive woman, Mrs. McGillicuddy, but um, but also also tries to keep the the girls, um, the the women, the young women that reside with her, you know, on on a good path. And uh, Helena Geller, who is um, Silver Spectre in her non hurt superhero persona, doubled back to the scene of the train to gather information that she could use to write a story, which she hoped would be a front page story in the morning paper for the, for the daily Eagle, which is the newspaper that she, she writes for. Um, and then, um, Jessica, we turned to Jessica and I, I said, listen, Jessica, you have, you know, Dan, you have this thing on Jessica. She, I'm just curious about how that's going to play off. And Dan, um, kind of narrated how, uh, just a car flew back to the lower Manhattan Brownstone where he uh, lives with uh, his, with Dylan's wife, Nadia, that he arrived on the, you know, on the balcony that he pulled off his helmet and turned back to Dylan outside. And that then he collapsed sobbing because of the, you know, the, the disconnect that he had with Maat over, over what had happened. And at that point, you know, we said that Nadia came out, looked around and put her arm around him and brought him back in him and, and basically held him until he was um, ready to, to, to relax. Right. So, um, and then after that, we turned to major shocker and it was interesting because major shocker, I didn't know this about Brett Bolton, who's major shockers, um, you know, real name, but Brett Bolton lives with his parents, but his parents are not in the know about, uh, about uh, uh, the major shocker persona at all. And what makes this weird and interesting to me is that his uncle, his father's brother, his uncle is one of the guys who's helped him uh, become major shocker, um, covers for him, um, and is in kind of... uh, uh, Communication, not communication, but he is um, works with Dr. Zapf and with uh, a guy by the name of Ned Cross. I kind of named him um, once Mike described him, I named him Ned Cross. So Ned Cross runs a gym in the neighborhood and has taught uh, Major Shocker how to fight and gives him kind of tactical advice and stuff. Um, Dr. Zapf is a guy who makes the gadgets and the uncle. Frank is uh, kind of the, the the guy who covers for him and the guy who kind of nurtures him. He's so there's this weird triumvirate of people that are helping Brett Bolton be Major Shocker, and the parents don't know, right? Um, his uncle has kept this from Brett's father, his the uncle's brother. Uh, I don't know. I find that uh, interesting and weird. And I didn't know all of that until Mike was kind of narrating because he, um, Brett didn't go straight home or Major Shocker didn't go straight to the home to be, um, you know, uh, Brett Bolton. He went to his uncle and his uncle gathered the tri- triumvirate. And Mike kind of took the reins in terms of the authorities on on these characters as he kind of explained and narrated how they probably interacted around his 
his bullet wound and around the situation. And if I remember correctly, right, the in terms of authorities, in terms of saying how NPCs behave, once they are kind of uh, created, that's my job. I think, if I remember correctly, um, from Champions Now, a rule book. But I was very happy for this open in this in this opening uh, session. Well, it's not the opening session of the game, but it's the opening session uh, for these particular characters. The first time we've seen them in play. I was very happy for Mike to kind of do that narration and explain to me what these guys were all like. And he said, he said that, you know, the uncle was gathering information and coming up with a plan as to how to spin it for the parents. So the parents wouldn't like be tipped off and wouldn't be too concerned. So the, the uncle Frank came up with the idea that it was a, a, a mob hit. Remember that, um, Brett, before he became Major Shocker, had stood up to the mob and um, had gotten beat up for it. And then it was shortly after that that uh, Major Shocker showed up on the scene and fought off uh, the mob and pushed them out of the neighborhood. Um, so the story that uh, that that the uncle came up with is that the mob might have some resentment over Brett not having been major shocker because nobody suspects that of course, but that he, there, there might've been some leftover resentment by a mob thug or something that was still in the neighborhood and that he just took a shot at him. Right. So that's a story that they were going to tell the parents. Mike then explained how Ned cross um, was the whole time that they were bandaging him up and taking care of him. Ned cross was like, you were weak. You need to be more aggressive. These people like this play for the poop. You got to go after them hard. You have to hit them hard. You can't, you know. So he was just giving them the tough guy kind of advice and saying, like, you can't play around, son. You know, you can't do this and stuff. And Major Shocker's taking this in and stuff. And then Dr. Zap was all um, apologies. He's like, it's my fault, my boy. You know, I made this suit and I was so um, interested in giving you speed um, and maneuverability that I didn't give you protection. And, and, and please, can I take your suit? You give me permission to take the suit and rectify that because I'll, you know, I can't live with myself if you end up dead on the streets, right? And so, so he ended up taking Major Shocker's suit in that scene. And this was interesting for me because it was a change to Major Shocker's character sheet. When we first built Major Shock, built Major Shocker, he had a um a magnetic zip power. He has two flight powers. One is a magnetic glide, which is flight, but only while in the proximity of like metal objects that he can kind of latch on to. It's almost like, uh, like Spider-Man swinging, but it's kind of telekinetic. And whenever there's kind of metal structures that he can kind of like, you know, glide on. And, but then he had a magnetic zip that would allow him to move, um, at, uh, uh, what's you know expanded expanded scale so he can get anywhere to the city essentially in an instant but he had no offensive powers really right so uh and, and mike hadn't said what changes he wanted to make on the character sheet but he was concerned about you know the fact that a bullet was able to take major shocker down so i i kind of gave him because i of the three of this triumvirate I had most ideas for how Zap would, would, would react. I had already thought a little bit about Zap. So I'm the one that actually played Zap's kind of request for the suit and all of that. And I, and I, I said, you know, basically I'm going to change Mike's character sheet if Mike will let me. And it's because the, the DMPC who is the, 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 the technologist here will be making a change. Right. And so, um, you know, and both as a player and as a character, right? Uh, Mike and Major Shocker were okay with this. So we erased, you know, the the zip power, the the um, the magnetic zip power, and replaced it with a with a, uh, an electromagnetic force field, right? It's a knob on his on his belt um, that he, you know, but he didn't get it immediately. He was going to have to wait at least a day to get it. So. So that was taken. And then after that, they they took Brett home and introduced him, you know, like uh, Frank talked to the parents and explained what had happened, basically fed them the lie. And they were very concerned, but of course, happy to see he was alive. And then, you know, they he went and got some sleep, you know.
So um, then after we had that whole interaction, we turned to Dylan, who awoke the next day. Um, Nadia, Nadia, his wife, um, had laid out a breakfast for him. And she also laid out the the front, uh, the, the newspaper, which had on the front page, Silver Legion foiled and dastardly plot to seize federal arms by the Sentinels of Justice, written by Helena Geller. This was the, the Daily Eagle, right? And um, Dylan, you know, took that, still shaken from the events of the previous night, went and taught his classes that morning. Um, and we, we basically just like narrated all of this, Dan kind of narrated all this. And then he said, you know, and afterwards he's going to settle in his office. Um, and he is going to produce the radio wristwatch that Dr. Zapp had made for everybody, uh, you know, for the Sentinels of Justice. And he contacted Major Shocker to see how Major Shocker was recovering from the night's events and his injuries. Right. So then we jump back to Brett and we say he's now at breakfast. You know, mom is feeding him. Dad's talking to people um, outside and pecking on his boy. And there's kind of like neighborhood community hubbub over like who might this mysterious shooter might have been. And there's all this concern. And in the in the midst of this kind of family scene, we hear a ping of the wristwatch go off um, from his bedroom and he excuses himself and he goes and he talks to Dylan um, and Dylan basically, um, uh, you know, he told Dylan that that and Brett told Dylan that he was doing well. And then Dylan said he was glad, glad to hear. And then he said, we need to get together this evening um, to debrief what happened. And before they could talk much more about that, there was a pounding at the door and the dad, kid, you know, comes out and says, I, I think I have a lead on who might've shot you. I think I have a lead on who might've shot you. There's, there's, you know, been word. I've been talking to some of the guys in the neighborhood and there's a word of a new gang in, in, in town. There's a, there's a, a a a a person that people are calling the big boss or the new big boss who's kind of moving in. There's talk that he's moving in on the commission's turf after this major shocker guy had pushed them out. You know, there's something going on, and uh, maybe it's that guy. Maybe maybe it's that that group, and um, uh, you know, this new this new uh, outfit. And um, Brett, I think I remember correctly, I had Brett make a presence attack to talk his dad out of that theory. And said, look, dad, there's, there's, uh, you know, there's, um, it, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't hold water. I, you know, and this was the first time that major shocker had heard that there was buzz of this new outfit that might be moving in. Um, so, you know, Mike said that he kind of filed that away, but he didn't want his dad to kind of like, uh, latch onto something that, you know, might get him into trouble. So presence attack to kind of talk him out of of that and the dad kind of looked deflated and kind of walked away and then we switched over to the daily eagle where helena was walking out of a meeting with her editor um and came out to a round of applause from the people in the bullpen i told her some of that applause is uh you know disingenuous some of it was heartfelt but she's a woman she's young he's jewish he has the favor of this editor somehow who's given her work and nobody can doubt that she's gotten in stories that other people could not get in part because of her superpowers, but she is somewhat resented for all of those other reasons. And so like it was kind of a mixed audience that was kind of like applauding when she came out of, into the bullpen and she's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then I mentioned that she saw a person who was not a colleague at the paper kind of, sitting at the at the um you know uh, like leaning against the the door into the bullpen just kind of observing the situation looking at her and then um uh when she got back to her desk he started moving towards her and this guy is somebody else that i decided to pull for, um at from um uh, from spitfire's feet this time right so and Spitfire on her sheet says she's hunted by a reporter who has ruinous intentions against her. He's a normal human being, but he's got ruinous intentions. We didn't really define what those ruinous intentions were, and we didn't have a name for this guy yet. But I decided to pull him in because as a reporter who just read that somebody, a rival newspaper, had gotten a story with this Sentinels of Justice for which Spitfire is connected to. That's somebody that he might be 
he's obsessed enough about Spitfire for whatever reason that he might be wanting to t touch base with that reporter for whatever reason. So his name is Flint Thims, and he went over to, uh, you know, uh, chit chat with uh, with Helena, invited her to lunch. She said, why don't we do coffee? They went to a nearby diner and they talked. And he basically told her that, uh, you know, he was kind of condescending to her. You know, he was kind of treating, he's, you know, he's an older guy. Um, well, he's, you know, he's probably in his 30s, but she's in her 20s. Um, and, you know, he's a man, she's a woman. And he was kind of like being condescending, like he had stuff to teach her. And uh, he was full of suggestions. And he said, you know, I admire the detail with which you covered the Silver Legion and what they were trying to do. But you didn't give much detail on the Sentinels of Justice. Like, did you think that maybe they might be just as bad or maybe even worse as the Silver Legion of America? I mean, who the heck are these guys operating the way they do with those fancy powers? All of that stuff. So he's like, listen, I've been following up on this uh, Spitfire and she's a loose cannon. You know, I'm, I've got kind of stories that I'm working on here. I've got an angle that I'm kind of working on here. And I know we work for rival papers, but maybe there's a way that we can kind of share information at some point. And um uh, and um, Helena was very guarded. She kind of talked to him to see what he had to say. He didn't say much more than that. Um, and I don't remember if I had to make had her make any presence attacks or anything in this scene. I don't think I did. I don't think it merited it. But um, essentially, when she kind of said, "Well, maybe, maybe," he's like, "All right, you think about it." And then he, uh, you know, paid for the coffee and went about his day. Right. So then um, we turned back to Justicar, who was um, having after after, you know, during during uh, his lunch hour, he was approached by Nadia, his wife, who surprised him with a picnic and said, look, let's go to Washington Square Park and let's just pass the afternoon together and talk. And uh, they did. And we, we kind of said, you know, you enjoy each other's company and she makes you laugh and you make her laugh. And then we shifted the conversation to say, you know, eventually she just starts to get real. And she starts to ask about like, you know, are you sure you're in control of yourself? And he's like, yeah, yeah. You know, Mott is different than me. I'm not my, I'm bothered by what happened last night, but that wasn't me. That wasn't me. It doesn't fall on me. And she's like, all right. Okay. And, you know, and he, he told her, you know, like, um, and he said, are you sure? He says, I'm sure as long as, you know, I have you as my anchor and stuff. And she was gratified for that. And he said, of course, I understand. Um, but but I'm a worried about the day when you will not be able to draw that line so clearly. And when, you know, when when these when your personalities, you know, there may come a day when your personalities start to, to merge. Um, and and I'm worried about that. And he's like, yeah, you know, I need to I need to really make sure that I have strong people at my side and people who understand me at my side. And for that reason, do you think you can go with some friends to go to the movies um, tonight and leave me the apartment? Because I'd like to invite my colleagues over and I don't want them to know you. And I don't think you want to know them, uh, you know, directly. Otherwise I'd ask you to stay, but um, you know, if, if I need to have these, the Sentinels of Justice over for dinner so that we can talk about what happened and I can explain to them what's going on. And she's like, yeah, of course, you know? And so she, you know, and I, I have to think about Nadia's motivations around all this because she, she is being very supportive and she's being very accepting. And I think she has reasons for that, but I'm still kind of, there's something more complex going on there and I have to figure out what that is. But for right now, we're just in the moment playing through, you know, these, these interactions. Um, but, uh, you know, Nadia agreed to that. So Dylan then contacted the rest of the, the team. Actually, I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself there, but anyway, so Nadia agreed to it. And so they ended their, their meal and they, they, they left. So we then jumped to back to Helena who said that, um, you know, uh, she was going to go visit um, Eliza Goodwin, who is Spitfire at the Hippodrome Theater. Eliza was there rehearsing for the musical Jumbo, which is a real um, musical that um, was was uh, being produced in 1935 in New York City. Um, I believe it had WPA, you know, funds that made it run, and so there's, you know, so I I I explained how 
there's, you know, because of the federal programs, the WPA, there's been a little bit of a boost in a somewhat depressed uh, 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 theater industry at this point. And um, people are optimistic that things are going to pick up, pick up with federal support. Um, and so anyway, Eliza was uh, up there um, uh, practicing at the hip, hip uh, rehearsing at the Hippodrome Theater for Jumbo when Helena walks into the theater. And I said, you notice a tall, strapping young man with red hair at the back of the theater who kind of looking at Eliza. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Helena Geller was like, hmm. He's interesting, you know. She 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 made something about like oh, he looks nice, and um and then so she sat not with him but within sight of him, and they were kind of watching as the 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 director kind of like the casting director kind of like uh, you know uh, stop the act and whatever the you know Liza and her I had them roll a presence attack to see how how well they performed and um. Eliza performed well, so she she got the attention of the of the uh, of the uh, the casting. It wasn't, yeah, it was not a rehearsal. It was an audition. So she got the attention of the casting director and seemed to have made it onto a short list. So, um, so I I described it as as uh, as Eliza was coming down uh, the stairs. Um, the young man got up and kind of moved up to her. And then I turned to uh, Eliza and said, you hear a voice, a man calling Lizzie, Lizzie. She looks up and it's her eldest brother, Dustin, who is heading towards her. And they go up and they start engaging in small talk. And the whole time that we're talking, it's like, <laughs> Jen, Jen, I thought played it really well because, you know, she knows what he's building up to, which is like, you don't belong here. You need to go back home. But they were sort of small talking. As they were going, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm in town because I heard that there was some construction work and I'm still looking for work. And so I'm kind of like sitting nearby. She's like, oh, unfortunately, I can't help, help have you stay at the boarding house. It's only girls. And he's like, yeah, I understand, whatever. And, you know, I wanted to talk to you about and things were kind of going up and up. And he, could, he was on the verge of kind of like dropping the question that would so annoy her. She was deflecting, deflecting. And at the moment that he was going to ask um Lauren said that that Helena said hello and cut in and kind of uh you know and it allowed um for the whole energy of the discussion to shift and then Eliza introduced Helena and then you know said that she was a, a reporter in the city and that she was doing important work and then it came up that she had written because Dustin had the newspaper in his hand right he had he had written the front he had written the front page of that and Dustin seemed kind of uh, thrown off about all of this, just uh, the new presence, the fact that she was a girl reporter and that, you know, that she kind of seemed to have it together and that she was confident and whatnot. And he just kind of sheepish, sheepishly said, oh yeah, you know, uh, you have important things to do and, you know, I'll catch up with you. And Eliza said, we'll have dinner in a couple of, of days. And he said, yeah, yeah, okay, that's that's good. And so they said an awkward goodbye at that point. And it was then that Helena told Eliza about Flint Sims's visit and all of this. And then the two got talking about what had been happening with, um, you know, what had happened with, uh, with just a car the night before and all of that. And that's when their, 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 you know, uh, their, their wristwatches began to ping um, wherever they had them on their person. I don't think they were wearing them, but they began to ping and it was um, Dylan inviting them over to the Brownstone that evening. And then after he invited them, he invited um, Brett to also come to the Brownstone. So they, um, they all agreed that they would do that. Okay. Before going over there though, um, Dylan said that he wanted to, you know, he was restless. He wanted to, he didn't want to convalesce all day. So he was restless. He wanted to walk the neighborhood and he was going to go see Dr. Zap. So when he went to go see Dr. Zap, I said, you hear somebody working in his workshop. And, uh, but when you ring the, 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 you know, when you ring the door, you get someone to the living quarters. So, uh, Brett went up to the living quarters where Dr. Zap was there with his suit laid out and stuff, but there was still somebody working in the, in his workshop. He's like, oh, yes, yes, it's an old it's an old colleague of mine, you know, who showed up um, kind of unannounced and was seemed to be in a jam. And so I told him he could use the workshop. He's doing some important work. 
Um, but I've got your your device here, right? So he he showed him the improvements on the suit, and we did a few rolls to see like if he can control the new power and stuff like that. He managed to make it so like the electromagnetic field didn't like blow off of him and like damage the house or anything like that. And right when they had kind of like gotten that under control and stuff, and he was starting to put it away, they heard steps coming up and the door opened. Well, the door didn't open. Somebody knocked on the door and Dr. Zapp ringed in that person that was working in his workshop. And that was a man by the name of Dr. Prometheus Bellows. Dr. Prometheus Bellows, I said, basically is played by Kelsey Grammer, right? <laughs> you know, and uh, he was thanking Dr. Zapp for allowing him to use the workshop. Um, he was bombastic, he was arrogant, you know, obviously full of himself, not unfriendly, not unfriendly, but just very bombastic and kind of full of himself and kind of like dismissive of, oh yes, you're here, dismissive of Brett. And then he, uh, basically returned the keys to Dr. Zapp and, uh, and he, he, he left and then, um, Dr. Zapp explained, oh yeah, yeah, he's a brilliant guy, but he's kind of like a. You know, he's kind of been done wrong by by the, the system, just like I have been. Right. So, you know, I'm always willing to to help out, a you know, a true. You know, kind of like a genius um, pursue his thing. He mentioned stuff about how Dr. Uh, 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 Dr. Bellows had been um, he's kind of a, a renaissance man, has a lot of, of specialties, but he's a, a biochemist and he had taken an interest in in um, strange radiations that he discovered while you know, working on something or another. So, um, so Brett was like, okay, well that's whatever. And, uh, then they, um, then we, we skipped to that night, right. Where, um, he left Dr. Zapp's place and joined all his teammates over at, um, at Dylan's home for, for dinner. And I really loved the conversation that happened there. Again, it was a totally in character conversation. The, the players are so rooted in their individual characters. And there was, there was like a this diversity of position on just car. So they had a nice meal and all of that. And then just a car started to say like, you know, okay, this is the reason I called you over and you need to know I am Dylan, but the person, you know, is just a car is kind of me, but there's a superimposed entity on there. And that is the goddess Ma'at. And, and she has a very a somewhat different set of priorities. We both believe in 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 upholding justice, but she's far more uncompromising uncom than me. And her decisions are someone sometimes like the one that you saw. I mean, he said it can get to the point where if you break a law, if you break a law, right, you could be subject to that. And I usually rein her in, but she's not. You know, she's she can be really um, ruthless, not ruthless, but really just cut and dry about that. And he's, he says, you know, I want to be more in control and I'm telling you this so that you all understand that you might need to help bring me in. And then um, it was Spitfire that was, well, actually, um, uh, Silver Spectre. Right. Helena Geller was like, you know what? I really wouldn't judge yourself too harshly about that last night. And people are like, you know, somebody objected. And then she was like, look, those people are out to eradicate people like me. I don't think you should be shedding a tear over what happened to those bad actors. Okay. This is a war. And, and that was strong right and again lauren has told me she didn't expect uh silver specter to be so on this it was spitfire who was like okay they're obviously bad actors but being measured is important being in control is important you're talking about breaking laws people are out there breaking laws to just live in the context of what we've been through, right? The nation's in crisis and, and there are people who have to break the law in order to live, you know? And uh, so how far do you, are you okay with us? Like resorting to physical violence to stop you? He's like, you know, just a car didn't say, yes, I am. He didn't say, no, I'm not. He's like, look, this is a complex 
situation it might you might need to really take a stance against me at some point you know and I'm, i you leave it up to you to decide what that is and then major shocker was like all right all right all right this is what i want to know i mean are you gonna turn is this mod is this goddess gonna turn on us like are you gonna come at my are we working with somebody who's gonna come after us and um just was just like we'll have to wait and see you know it's like we we don't i can't make you any promises we'll just have to find out we'll have to wait and see and there was just something so so nice about the way that the whole thing just flowed and and again i'm not talking about like immersion and acting and all of that it was just you know it wasn't all in in character voices or anything like that it was slipping in and out of you know out of out of just describing what was going on and, and actually you know kind of acting out the roles and all of that but it was just it was just so rooted in the individual characters and heroes and i loved just watching the kind of like the different angles and facets that they all brought to this kind of like you know to this team and that there was this big question mark over all of it i kind of felt like like the the players in this moment are embracing the we'll play to see what happens mentality that this is unpredictable and we don't know where it's going to go kind of mentality i was like my heart was just leaping i was just so happy to kind of see that um there so um and then they they got to talking about other things they took things they talked about flint sims they talked about what they might do with that they talked about um you know uh uh, Major Shocker mentioned the big boss that he had just heard about and who that might be moving into his neighborhood. And they did all these things. And then they they said, okay, they decided to break. It was late, so they decided to break for the night. And uh, they all went home. So then when Brett went back home, again, he's walking through the streets as Brett Bolton. And folks come running up and they're like, did you see the light show over in the junkyard on Ralph Avenue? And like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. There's something big that happened over there. People were talking about cars flying through the air and like, you know, and uh, you know, and like some sort of like giant octopus or something in the junkyard and stuff like that. And so um, uh, Brett, you know, slipped away, changed into his, um, into his upgraded major shocker outfit made his way over to the junkyard and uh yeah sure enough there was like a car sticking out of a of a of a bill the second story uh building you know a second story wall of, of the building um adjoining the junkyard there was there were scorch marks all over the junkyard there was crash that had been moved around and at that point mike said okay major shocker is going to basically stand on a and he has a detective work that is intuitive. It's about intuition. He doesn't research. He doesn't. He doesn't pick up clues. He just sometimes get these gets these flashes of inspiration. It's more intuitive than it is, you know, investigation. And so he stood up on top of a of a nearby building, and he um, said that he wanted to use his detective work to see if he could figure out what had happened. And so I let him make the detective work role and. I let him basically piece together, you know, kind of like piece together that there was something large that was moving through to the junkyard, pushing aside junk and these swirls and stuff like that, that whatever it was, was, um, seemed to be made of like, a uh, vegetation and, and, and dirt. And, um, and that there was enough of that trail that pointed to a sewer grate in the very, very back of the junkyard. He could tell that whatever it was had retreated back there and that whatever it was seemed to have been, um, where, you know, the scorch marks that were in here or that accounted for the light show were, um, directed at spots where this mass of, of vegetation and, 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 uh, and, and muck had been right so um at that point um uh, major shocker called the rest of the sentinels of justice on his wristwatch and they all arrived at the scene after some time so 
here they started to kind of debate, okay, what are we going to do? What are they going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And um, it, it started, you know, it's interesting. Sometimes, sometimes um, my player group tends to, I don't know if this is good or bad. I don't want to judge the behavior, but um, it, it's, um, <laughs> um, they they they'll tend to um talk about possibilities rather than than act and of course that's something that you want to do but sometimes it it starts to kind of like it's like it gets stuck and it's kind of repetitive and there's like what if what if what if what if what if what if and it kind of like might go like there for like that for a while and so they were standing on this rooftop the sentinels of justice kind of like going to one of the into those kind of what if moments eventually they 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 sent, you know, or, or silver uh, specter um, said that she would go down into the grate and have a look. So she went into the grate and I said, okay, uh, she, she made a detective wor uh, work role. She made it, it wasn't a detective work. I think it was a participant perception role. And she found um, some white hair and some blood down there. And uh, she could also tell that, the the trail there was a trail of muck and vegetation that went off into the sewers in, in a particular direction and it was around this point that um Jessicar said you know what i'm going to fly into the air and i'm going to kind of do a, a spiral around and kind of see if i see anything kind of watching the scene and he made a perception roll and he noticed somebody he didn't know somebody wearing a very loud suit you know uh with a device in his hand uh, in an alley, kind of watching the scene. There were police and stuff around. There was a, you know, people, but he was kind of removed from all of that, watching the neighborhood, wiping his forehead, blood off his forehead, and doing something on the device. And he swooped down and picked him up and, and brought him to the other Sentinels of Justice as a suspicious person. And it was Dr. Prometheus Bellows. And that's when Dr. Bellows kind of told his story. And he said, look, um, I have made a terrible error. I am a scientist and I have lab technicians that have been exposed to this meteoric substance that has physically transformed them into monsters and they're now dangerous. And I've perfected this device that can track them, which is what he was working on Dr. Dr. Zapp's office, that can track them, but I tracked them to this junkyard and they got the best of me and there was a gash on his forehead. And he told them, um, one of them is a man by the name of uh, Peter Boggs. Yes, Pete Boggs. I know, but it's the golden age. You got to have some of that in there. At least I feel I do. Right. So, and he's been turned into this like, you know, giant, you know, swamp monster. And then there's Marva, another one of my lab, lab assistants who've been turned into like a rat woman and they're dangerous. And we need to go down there and find, I need to go down there and find them and try to see if I can turn them back to normal, right? Um, it's my fault. I can't just let this go. And they didn't trust them, but they were like, all right, obviously there's something going on here. We'll go with you, right? And so they descended into the sewers. And then basically, you know, he had that on the device. I explained how on the device he seemed to be cracking two. He had two different blips one bigger than the other and he seemed to focus on one kind of like sideline the other one kind of left his little screen and he was focusing on one and uh, he led them through and then he said yes there down that way and as they got closer um you know uh like tendrils of you know vegetation started to pull in from all the different you know kind of like uh, channels that were in the sewers and this mound of earth and, you know, and, and vegetation rose up in front of them in a gurgling form and then started to move towards them to attack. And that is where we cut the session, right? So, you know, session three promises to open up with a combat, right? And that's, that's how this session went. So, um, reflections on the session, um, you know, I, I wonder, like, I would have liked to have seen a little more system at play. We did make a few, 
you know, at the end, of course, we need detective work roles and perception roles and and whatnot. Um, we made some presence attacks throughout the thing. So I, I don't think I was actually, when I look back, I don't think I was deficient in any kind of use of the system in there, really. But I'm always looking for more opportunities to to have presence attacks play a role in some of these interactions or things like that. Um, but all in all, what I what I was really taken with in the session is that, you know, I, what did I plan for this? I knew that there were, I knew that I wanted the brother to make an entrance, Dustin. I wanted, I wanted him to make an entrance. I knew that I wanted Flint Sims to have a conversation with Helena Geller. Um, and, and one of those is just because I was tugging at a character feet. The other one of those is because Flint Sims lives in this universe by virtue in this city, by virtue of being on Spitfire Sheet, and something happened in the world that activated him. If it hadn't been for Helena publishing the story, I wouldn't have even thought of Flint Sims. But because the story was published, Flint Sims got activated because he's a reporter. She's a reporter. He has an interest in her subject matter. So he came in. Um, so actually I didn't know that I wanted to activate Flint Sims until, until we were already in play and it occurred to me in the midst of play. I wanted to bring Dustin in that one. I, I, that one I knew I wanted to bring in. And then, um, I knew that Prometheus Bellows was going to be activated as Dr. Zapp's hunted. And again, he's just manipulative to Dr. Zapp. Uh, he just wanted to use Zap's workshop to fix the device that had been damaged um, in a previous encounter. Because that's the thing. Dr. Bellows said he had been tracking them for a while and he'd had a couple of run-ins with them. Um, so he he had failed to capture them once, gone to Dr. Zap's, fix his device, tra then tracked them to the to the uh, to the junkyard, and then had that interaction, which didn't work out for him. And then met the Sentinels of Justice. So I knew, I knew that, I knew that I'd be introduced. That I knew that that Prometheus Bellows would be in the neighborhood, but I didn't know that Dylan would go and meet him before, because I didn't know Dylan was going to go to Doctor Zapp's later that day. So I didn't know that they would meet there before they the whole group met him. It would have been very possible for um, for um, Major Shocker to have gotten suspicious of Bellows at that point and maybe made a detective role at that point and that there would have been a very different outcome. They might have they might have all encountered or maybe just Major Shocker might have encountered Marva and Peter Boggs, you know, assuming that's who they really are, but he he might have encountered them along with Dr. Bellows at the junkyard, right? Um, depending on what happened. So that's about all I knew. Everything else just rolled along because the characters were dealing with the heroes were dealing with the consequences of what had happened in the first session of play. And, um, and so, you know, there, it was, it was very rich in that. And I think that there's a lot of new um, waves that are being created as this thing is moving. And, you know, it, it it's, it, it's a little, not intimidating because it's it's um it's all fun it's you know but there's there's like a bit of like okay can i keep up with this? can i keep up with this can i keep up with this but i find that using the now recording all those little waves in the now and then just giving them a skim right before the next session saying okay which one of these are going to be active now which one of these are going to kind of keep building to be active later I don't know about those. We'll worry about those if and when we get to them. Let me focus on the few that make sense to be active now. And that's what's carrying me to the next session. So developing, meandering, building all at once, a lot of fun. All right. So I'm going to cut it there. Thank you so much for staying here to the end. If you did, um, as always, I wish you good health, good cheer. Good gaming. Goodbye.